morning, 11.30 Church. Great to see you all. Great to see many of you here on time as well. I'm not sure how your week has been this week, whether it's been a good week or a bad week, whether it's been a normal, normal, old kind of week, or whether it's been, oh, it's a new week, it's exciting. This week, we get together and we're going to do a new sermon series called uh, Under the Book of Song of Songs. One great thing about coming to church on Sunday is that not only do we get to hear God's word, we get to be a community, we get to care for each other. And so one of the things that we can do is to encourage each other by singing to each other and singing with each other. That's what we do at church. So we're going to stand and sing together before we get into the service. Psalm chapter 68 verse 4 says, Sing to God, sing in praise of his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. Rejoice before him. His name is the Lord. Let's stand and we sing praises to our God. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit,
Jesus, Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel. Father, we come to you broken, we come to you humbly, because we know that we could never have the relationship with our Father without you, had you not given up your life to die on the cross, to rescue us sinners. Father, thank you that even though we were your enemies, you rescued us, you loved us, and you are redeeming us so that we have a home to be together with you forever. Father, indeed, our hope is always and should always be in you for your glory. Father, we pray that you might help us to remember that it is your agenda. It is you that we live for and it is you that we seek to obey. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus. 
seat. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are a God of love. You have created us in love. You have sustained us in your love. You have rescued us as an act of love. And you call us day by day, moment by moment, into your loving presence to worship you, to praise you, to respond to you in love. And we pray that this morning, this time together, that we might know, experience, and enjoy your love for us. This, Father, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to uh, St. Andrew's Church for our 1130 service. My name is Leslie. It's great to gather together with you in worship of the living God. Uh, welcome to those who are new. Uh, maybe you're passing through. Uh, you're visiting uh, Hong Kong or visiting St. Andrew's. Uh, maybe you're just uh, popping into this church to see whether this might be a new place to call your spiritual home. Uh, it's great to welcome you in particular, uh, as well as welcoming all those who are regulars uh, with us. Uh, that uh, first song uh, we sang, we will rise with you, lifted on your wings, and the world will see that our God saves. Uh, wonderful that the whole world is called to know this God. And, and so wherever you're from, uh, wherever your journey in life has taken you, uh, great today that all of us, uh, along with the whole world, have been invited to come and to know this wonderful God who is love. Uh, now this morning we uh, start a new teaching series in the book of Song of Songs. We're calling it, um, well, uh, a, a series called A Crazy Little Thing uh, Called Love. Uh, and for those who are familiar with the Bible, you might think, oh, uh, Song of Songs, not a book that I know well. Uh, well, if you've been here any length of time, you'll know that it's our normal pattern to uh, pick different books of the Bible, uh, to let the Bible set the agenda for our teaching, for our thinking, for our learning. Uh, and so we, we study this book of the Song of Songs over these next four or five weeks, and later Alex is going to come and preach to us from uh, those opening chapters. Uh, the Song of Songs, it's a Hebrew way of speaking out about the best thing. So if you think about Jesus as the King of Kings, he's the greatest king. Or in the tabernacle temple of worship, there's the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. And here in this Song of Songs, this is the greatest song in all the history of the world. Uh, and what is this song about in the Bible? It's a celebration of love uh, between two lovers uh, as we see throughout the course of the book that their relationship grow and uh, deepen. Uh, there's a uh, wonderfully poetic language that explores uh, themes of love and of desire, of intimacy and of longing. Uh, and the beauty of this artistic language is that it's neither graphic nor vulgar, uh, but it captures something of that, that intimacy, uh, that intensity uh, of love. Uh, but what we're going to see in this Song of Songs is that it's much more than just a celebration of human love. Uh, it points beyond human love to the one who created a world in which there is love, uh, the one who is love itself. Uh, in this series, we're going to see God's heart for us, his people. Uh, because that's where love originates, in God, not in humanity. Uh, love is not something we've come up with, a good idea that people have created, but it finds its source in the God who is himself love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, caught up, bound up in love, and who has created us to share in that love. Uh, now, as we think about love, though, uh, before we go any further, we come to a time of confession. A time to acknowledge that we are not always full of love. We've not always loved God as we ought. We've not always loved our neighbors as ourselves. We've failed to receive love and we've failed to give love. And at the heart of it all, we have denied God's love itself. And so we're going to have a few moments of quiet reflection, a chance to bring before the Lord our own lack of love. And then I'll invite you in a moment to join in with a prayer of confession. Just a few moments of quiet now. If 
you would like to, then please do join in with this prayer of confession, joining with the words in yellow on the screen. We say together, God of love, in the wrong we have done and in the good we have not done, we have sinned in ignorance, we have sinned in weakness, we have sinned through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry. We repent and turn to you. Forgive us and renew our lives through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Oh, may you know the certainty, the assurance of God's love for you. For the Bible says that you are a forgiving and good, O oh Lord. Abounding in love to all who call to you. In Christ we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Uh, we're going to continue in a time of prayer as Ming comes to lead us. Good morning, St. Andrews. As we, be as we come before our Father, I'll read this verse from the Song of Songs, illustrating God's love for us. So from Song of Songs, chapter 8, verse 6. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death, jealousy is as fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love, and thank you for the reminder that your love runs deeper and more passionately than we can truly comprehend. You desire to be sealed in our hearts and on our arms, for you are a jealous God, whose passion and love for us led you to death, death on a cross. Father, we are unworthy to be called your slaves, let alone regarded as your beloved children. But because of Jesus' sacrifice and resurrection, we are your special possession, your precious children, who are deeply and fiercely loved. Help us to love you in return, to see you as more beautiful than anything this world has to offer. You are the greatest treasure, the perfect bridegroom, with a beauty and majesty that is unsurpassed. Grant us through your Holy Spirit, clear spiritual vision that enjoys your beauty and revels in your love for us, so that we may love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and with all our mind. Here in St. Andrews, we thank you for the many visitors. Help them to feel welcomed and connected. Make us St. Andrews a community which actively cares and encourages newcomers to grow in faith in Jesus. Through your Holy Spirit, work in us to be a community that makes people feel welcomed, just as your son welcomed all people, especially those that society excluded, the poor, the suffering, the weak, or those who are different. Make St. Andrews a place in which we love each other and look out for each other's interests, so that people may see the love Jesus has for us, for Jesus sacrificed his life to save ours. Thank you for our kids' zone and youth ministries, for the opportunities that we have to teach and encourage our children in the faith, and for the ministry of the leaders and volunteers. Give the teachers and leaders wisdom and love to teach the Bible faithfully, as well as modeling Jesus' behavior to the children and youth. Help faith to grow in our children's hearts. Through your spirit, open their spiritual eyes and give them hearts and minds to know you, so they may see your beauty and the good news of the cross that they may be changed and have a desire to follow you because they love you. In Hong Kong, we bring before you the families under pressure, whether through financial, inadequate housing, work expectations, schooling, relationships, or difficult home environments. Please provide for their needs, whether it is through financial resources, emotional support, and friendships. Equip and work through your churches, your people, to help meet these needs. Encourage Hong Kong's Christians to meet the needs of those who are suffering, imitating Jesus' love for all people, so that those who suffer may glorify you for your provision. We ask for wise government policies that support families, providing for their needs. Help move the government to care for its people and to be compassionate for those that are suffering. We also bring before you the many Hong Kong, Hong Kong teenagers suffering from depression and other mental Ill issues. Please provide more understanding within the community, good support structures, strength and healing for those who struggle. In a culture where money and work are idols, help these teenagers to find you and to see that you do not place unreasonable expectations on your people, unlike money and work. 
For you welcome the weary and the burden to give you their burdens and pain because you are gentle and kind and give them rest in exchange. Help these teenagers to find rest and comfort in you. In the world we bring before you the US elections, thank you that though the polls show great uncertainty who will win the election, the election winner has been determined by you already to bring about your purposes. Whoever leaves this country, whether through good or bad policies, right or wrong conduct in office, may the needs of the poor, marginalized and oppressed be met. If you will it to be, may, they be, may there be healing of political divisions. We especially pray for our Christian brothers and sisters in the USA. Help them to correctly prioritize their allegiances. Work their, in their hearts to put you first before their political positions, to be truthful and faithful witnesses, and to fix their eyes on you alone. Help them to point other Americans to you and to be gracious and loving, especially of other Christians, regardless of the re election result, so that you may be glorified and their hope in you, rather than a US president, will be revealed to a US community. Lastly, we bring before you the wars in the Middle East and Ukraine. We ask for your protection on the civilians and for aid to continue reaching those who are suffering. If it is your will, make the wars cease and peace to come to the region as well as justice to be given to those who suffer and those who have perpetrated crimes. For the Christians living in these regions, empower them to be faithful witnesses with their hearts sealed in faithfulness to you and their mouths declaring your praises, despite the horrific circumstances they are enduring. May your beauty and your majesty be their joy and their love for you be the driving force that helps them endure and live their lives well as you dwell amongst them as you promised forever. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, who loves us. Amen. We will now say the Lord's Prayer, which Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thanks, Ming, for leading us uh, in prayer. Uh, welcome again to you all. Uh, hopefully, as you came in, you picked up one of our uh, bulletins. Um, plenty of information there about things happening in the life of the church. Uh, there's our Bible reading, uh, which we'll have a read for us in a little while. Uh, rather than our normal pattern of having a church member come and read uh, for us uh, as we go through this series, uh, Song of Songs uh, has two main voices between a man and a woman, uh, at this poetic uh, uh, voice conversation dialogue that they have with each other. And so we'll be using uh, recorded um, uh, readings with a man and a woman's voice. So do follow along that, with that later in that bulletin. As well as that, there's a brief introduction to um, the book of Song of Songs written in there by Alex. Uh, so do have a look at that. Uh, and lastly, on the Song of Songs, uh, underneath the reading on the bottom right, uh, you'll see a, a number of book recommendations. As we touch on themes of love and of relationships, uh, as we think about marriage and singleness, uh, here are just a number of books touching on different topics around relationships, which yeah, you may find helpful. Uh, we recommend these to you. Uh, not an exhaustive list by any means, um, but these are ones that we've read and which we find are helpful. So do pick up a copy. Um, online PDFs, uh, you can find those uh, at uh, any of those major bookstores that you normally buy your books. Um, I'll leave you to look at the rest of those notices. In a moment, we're going to have our video notice about women's events, uh, and then we'll uh, have that Bible reading. But before we do that, we're going to take a moment to greet each other, to say hello to those around us, uh, our normal pattern of giving everyone a chance to welcome and to be welcomed. Um, and to express something of our fellowship together. If you're not quite sure what to talk about, we often give you a bit of a, a nudge and a direction. We've just had Halloween. We're thinking about love today. Uh, if you had to watch a movie, why don't you ask those around you? Uh, would you rather watch a horror movie or a romantic comedy? Uh, and if neither of those, then what would you like to watch? And uh, what, what's your favorite movie of those sorts of genres? A, a topic of conversation. Uh, can I invite you please to stand? Uh, the peace of the Lord be with you. Thanks very much.
St. Andrews, November is here and that means Christmas is around the corner. We'll be hosting lots of events for the whole family, but this one is just for women. Mark Saturday the 30th of November on your calendars to enjoy a night of Christmas fun. This includes consuming festive treats made by our amazing St. Andrews Bakers, a Christmas Carol's trivia quiz, the option to make your own macrame star, and shopping to support our mission partners, Christian Action, Crossroads Foundation, and Sons and Daughters. Finally, the highlight of this evangelistic event will be a talk from Jill, as she challenges us to wonder anew at the star that proclaimed the birth of Jesus. So, invite your friends and sign up soon as spaces are limited. More information can be found on our What's On page and I'll see you there. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out, therefore virgins love you. Draw me after you, let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will exult and rejoice in you. We will extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. I am very dark but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kidur, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Tell me, you whom my soul loves, where you pasture your flock, where you make it lie down at noon. For why should I be like one who veils herself beside the flocks of your companions? If you do not know, O oh, most beautiful among women, follow in the tracks of the flock and pasture your young goats beside the shepherd's tents. I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of jewels. We will make for you ornaments of gold studded with silver. While the king was on his couch, my nard gave forth its fragrance. My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of Engedi. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful, your eyes are doves. Behold, you are beautiful, my beloved, truly delightful. Our couch is green. The beams of our house are cedar, our rafters are pine. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. As a lily among brambles, so is my love among the young women. As an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. With great delight I sat in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am sick with love. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand embraces me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to St. Andrews. Uh, that's not the normal kind of Bible reading uh, we have here today. If you're feeling unusually warm, uh, we do have the air conditioning on. It's probably not because of that. Uh, we're going to keep uh, reading this series, as Leslie said, over the next four weeks as we seek God's wisdom for this wonderful part of uh, human life. Let me pray for us as we think about this passage. Uh, Lord God, we do recognise that you are the giver of all good gifts. We thank you that Jesus is called the wonderful counsellor. In him is wisdom and truth and love. Uh, we, we confess that we need your help uh, to use the gifts that you give us well. 
for the care of those around us, for your glory. So as we think about this fascinating uh, little book in the Bible, uh, much misunderstood, uh, Lord, guide and direct our thoughts. Uh, Help us to obey you, to delight in your gifts, but more so to delight in you and to find our strongest longing, our identity, our purpose in Christ alone. And we ask these things in his name. Amen. Uh, You may have read the famous book, uh, Jane Eyre. Uh, Jane Eyre is an orphan. She has a difficult life. And she grows up as she grows up. No one really cares for her. She feels incredibly lonely. And she she just wants to be loved. And then she meets the handsome Mr. Rochester. Uh, He loves her and she loves him. But he is married Uh, His wife is still alive. She has a mental illness, but he is still married. Mr. Rochester wants to be with Jane, but she has this dilemma because Jane believes that marriage is for life, for better or for worse. That's her conviction. She knows in her mind that is right, but her heart tells her, why don't you go and be with Mr. Rochester? This internal dilemma is expressed when she says, not a human being that has ever lived could wish to be loved better than I was loved. And him who thus loved me, I absolutely worshipped. She's incredibly conflicted. Mr. Rochester is pleading with her, would you be with me? But she holds firm to what she believes is right. And then towards the end of the story, there's this internal dialogue within Jane. While he spoke, my very conscience and reason turned traitors against me and charged me with crimes in resisting him. Oh, comply, it said. Tell him you love him and will be his. Who in the world cares for you? Or who would be injured by what you do? Still, indomitable was the reply. I will keep the law given by God. I will hold to the principles received by me when I was sane and not mad as I am now. Laws and promises are, uh, principles are not for times when there is no temptation. They are for such moments as this. If at my individual convenience I might break them, what would be their worth? Foregone determinations are all I have at this hour to stand by. There I plant my foot. Uh, Jane Eyre's dilemma probably captures what many of us experience in life. Well, what do you do with your deep longings in life? After all, to be a human being is to have longings. We have things that we deeply desire. Our hearts ache for particular things. And we look for all sorts of outlets for those desires. Uh, maybe your longing is for for money and and, and fortune. Uh, J.D. Rockefeller was at one stage the wealthiest man in the US and he was asked once, how much money do you need to be happy? And he just replied by saying, just a little bit more. Or maybe your longing is for success and achievements. Uh, Jack Higgins, the great novelist, was once asked, what do you wish you knew as a 21-year-old that you now know? His reply, well... When you get to the top, there is nothing there. Another human longing, a deep longing, is that of love and and, and romance. And and that's what we turn to in the Song of Songs. Um, Today we're starting this four-week series in the Song of Songs and we're borrowing the title from that famous song by Queen, a crazy little thing called love. Because... That's the thing with love. It's it's not a little thing. It is such a big thing. Love, sex, marriage occupy so much of our thoughts, our priorities, our hopes, our planning in life. It's no small thing. Now, I want to recognize at the very start that we'll all have different feelings as we look at this song. Um, For some of us, love and marriage has been a source of great joy and satisfaction. For others of us, it's been a source of incredible pain. Uh, Maybe it's been the pain of unsatisfied longing, unwanted singleness. Maybe it's the pain of a, a difficult marriage. You feel deep hurt, you've experienced abuse. Or maybe it's the the guilt, profound guilt that you feel 
about the cause that you have caused to others. We know that the more expectations that you put on something, the more pain that exists when those expectations aren't fulfilled. We also need to recognise the awkwardness of this book. It's not just trying to understand actually what's going on between this man and the woman. It's the often very intimate and explicit language that they use to describe their desires for one another. You kind of feel like you've crashed a romantic date between two people who very much want to be left alone together. Uh, David Cook is, used to be a principal at a Bible college in, in Sydney and uh, he was once preaching at a Chinese church in Sydney and the pastor there said to him, listen David, we don't talk about sex in Chinese churches. Sex are a problem for Western churches, not us. <laughs> But David replied by saying, well, simply, hang on, there are 1.4 billion people in China. You're obviously having a lot of sex. You need to learn about this. And that's the thing. God has given us love, sex and marriage. Do you think he would have given us these wonderful gifts without also telling us how to use them properly? No, here, here is a book in the Bible that majors on the love between a man and a woman. We need to learn what the Bible teaches about these important areas. Otherwise, by default, we are going to be discipled by our world that has a very different view on these things. So a few thoughts uh, on this book before we actually look at today's passage. Um, this book is called The Song of Songs and that's a Hebrew way of saying something is superlative, as Leslie said before, the holy of holies, the most holy. The Song of Songs simply means the best song, the ultimate song. This book is often called also the Song of Solomon. That might mean that King Solomon was the author of it, but it likely means that he is associated with it. It might be dedicated to him or published by him because this book is part of the wisdom literature in the Old Testament. Um, that's where we get Ecclesiastes and the book of Proverbs that are also associated with King Solomon. It's unlikely that Solomon is actually the main male character in this song because this song is about the exclusive relationship between a man and a woman and we know that King Solomon, he wasn't exclusive, 700 wives, 300 concubines. But it's also important for us to know that this book is poetry. A love song is a love poem put to music. Um, we need to read this song as actually a collection, a grouping of different love poems. If you read this song like it's a short story, you're going to get frustrated. It's not going to make sense to you and that's not how it's supposed to re be read. You listen to its message kind of like you'd listen to a, a playlist of music at a wedding reception. Now, the history of interpreting this song has been quite varied. Um, for a long time, people looked at this book like it was an allegory. In other words, it was describing the love between Yahweh and Israel or, or Jesus and His church. So it wasn't about sex, it was an allegory. But so many of the details in this song are so explicit, explicitly human and sexual, that it's, it's hard to say that its meaning is allegorical. Um, it, it is about the love between a man and a woman. However, it does point us to the love between Jesus and Israel his people because this book is all about longings the deep desires that we often feel for relationship and love and and security and significance within those kinds of relationships longings that have been hardwired into us but deep longings deep desires that the bible tells us can only be ultimately met in a relationship with god the Song of Songs pushes us in that direction. And so then as we begin to look at this passage today, we're just going to see three things. A burning desire, a self-conscious hesitation, and then lastly, uh, an encouragement towards patience. Uh, this song begins with a burning desire. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Um, we don't know this woman's name. This is quite an introduction. We don't know her name. At this stage, we don't know who the object of her desire is. Uh, we don't know if this desire is reciprocated or if she's going to be able to consummate this desire. Uh, but her desire seems to be 
immense, overwhelming, intoxicating, because as you read through the rest of the passage, it affects all her senses. There's taste, verse 2, for your love is better than wine. Or chapter 2, verse 1, his fruit was sweet to my taste. There's smell, verse 3, your anointing oils are fragrance. Sight, chapter 2, verse 3, um, as an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. In other words, she's saying, the guy I like is hot. He's better than all the other guys. There's touch, uh, chapter 2, verse 6, his left hand is under my head, his right hand embraces me. It's like she feels her, her love's physical presence all around her. In other words, all the senses, taste, smell, sight, touch, she's absolutely affected, overwhelmed by her desire. Ian Duguid, uh, who writes a commentary about this song, says, here is a book about desire from beginning to end, desire stirred. Desire frustrated, desire satisfied, desire frustrated again, but above all else, desire. So what is this lady supposed to do with her desires? Does she pick up a brochure from the EDB and just go and play badminton? Is that what she's supposed to do? Now, we all know that there are different attitudes towards uh, sex that we might see. Think of two. The first is that sex is a natural appetite. If you feel like it, Just do it. Uh, This mentality comes from a strand of Greco-Roman thinking that that, that viewed uh, any human activity as an appetite, like eating or sleeping, if you feel like it, just do it. Uh, It's one human activity among many others, but like anything, just be careful not to overdo it. Now, you can probably see that this attitude still exists in our world today, to the point where in our society, instead of sex being a taboo or an immensely personal topic, it's pervasive, it reaches all aspects of society, it's covered in our advertising, it reaches into every part of of popular culture, movies, TV, film, to the point where now people take it for granted that if you're a normal person, um, you will have sex regardless of whether you're in a, a romantic relationship or not, it's an appetite to be satisfied. Just do it. A very different attitude towards sex is that sex is negative. This comes from a different strand of Greek philosophy. Plato, that's a philosopher, talked about the dual nature of human beings. The physical side, which was degrading, the spiritual side, the soul, which was civilized and rational and eternal. All the part that's physical, including sex, is just necessary but evil And so sex is necessary but evil. And this view of sexuality uh, became popular in many parts of the church. Uh, Truly spiritual people should remain celibate. Uh, Sex is only for producing babies and that's it. Don't take pleasure, certainly don't take pleasure in sex. Now, neither of these two attitudes are the Bible's view of sex. In fact, if you go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, the first command that God gives people is, have sex. Now that's, if I'm honest, a loose translation. Uh, God tells the man and the woman, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. But you know what I mean. Now this comes, this commandment comes in the context of the story of humanity, which begins with one man, one woman, Adam and Eve, And God says it's not good for the man to be alone. Adam needs an equal but complementary companion. And so God makes a woman. And then when Adam sees her, he gets excited. He suddenly breaks out in poetry. You know a guy is excited when he starts speaking poetry. And he says, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. The first human words in recorded history are expressed in the form of a love song, which the Bible immediately places in the context of a wider marriage, of marriage. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, forsaking all other human relationships, including the parental relationship, A husband and wife are bound together in an exclusive, lifelong union that is secured by the promise of abiding hope. Now, because we're often very familiar with this passage, Genesis 2, the 
the, the astonishing significance of what is going on here can often be lost on us. The Bible begins with the story of creation. God is at work making the universe. Light shines out of darkness. Stars are flung into space. But here, against this backdrop, we're introduced to one man and one woman who are joined together in marriage. It's right at the very beginning. Uh, You you may have heard the story um, that when Neil Armstrong first walked on the moon, apart from saying that famous statement, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, apparently he uttered a weird remark. Good luck, Mr Gorski. Now, over the years, many people asked Neil Armstrong what that remark meant, but he never replied, he just smiled. Until eventually, one year, he decided to respond. Apparently, Mr. Gorski had passed away and now it was okay for him to talk about the story. When Neil Armstrong was a very young boy, uh, he was playing baseball with his friend in his front yard and his neighbours were called the Gorskis. Uh, Neil's friend hit the baseball into the Gorskis' front yard and as Neil went over there as a young boy to go and pick it up, he picked it up just below his neighbour's bedroom window. And he overheard Mrs. Gorski shouting at Mr. Gorski saying, Sex? You want sex? You'll have sex when that boy next door walks on the moon. (laughs) Think about it, think about it. Now, I'm pretty sure that story is made up. (laughs) But you get the idea of what Mrs. Gorski is doing wrong. You see, if we look at the Bible, the Bible is full of covenants, promises. A marriage is a covenant. A promise. It's a public, legal, binding agreement between two people. And there are all sorts of ways in the Bible in which covenants are ratified. In the covenant of marriage, sex is the way of expressing the deep unity that exists between a husband and wife. They are united, they become one flesh. It's the way of expressing a deep personal union, psychological, emotional. Uh, That's why the Bible says there shall be no physical union without all of life union. Uh, Sexual desire is is a beautiful, it's a wonderful part of God's creation within the bounds of a union between a husband and wife. Two people saying to one another, I love you, I'm I'm committed to you, I'm going to be with you forever. That's the context for this song and the Bible's teaching on love, sex, and marriage. So the first thing we've seen is is a desire, and then the second thing we see is a a self-conscious hesitation. The woman says in verse 6, Do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's sons were angry with me. Uh, They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Um, One of my pet hates is walking down Nathan Road when the sun is shining and being poked in the head with an umbrella. (laughs) Now, you might have experienced that. People use umbrellas here, even when the sun is shining, to protect themselves from getting burnt. Uh, In some cultures, getting a suntan is ugly. In other cultures, getting a suntan is very attractive. When I was at university, you could spot the American exchange students from a mile away because they were the ones with the orange spray-on tan. They had that sort of Trump glow about them. Now, the woman here is self-conscious about her dark skin. The song, though, isn't putting a value judgment on the colour of her skin. This is not a racial thing, it's a social comment. Uh, Wealthy people in those times were able to stay indoors. It was the poor people who 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 had to work outside. In effect, this song is telling us a Cinderella story. This woman comes from a poor background. Her stepbrothers are making her work outside to care for the vineyards. Now she thinks she doesn't measure up to the beauty standards of her particular culture. Further down in in chapter 2, she says, I'm a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. Uh, Comparing herself to a flower might make us think that she finds that she's attractive. But actually, a rose of Sharon or a lily of the valley are just common desert wildflowers. This is a way of her being self-deprecating. It's like she's saying, I'm just a a dandelion in a football field. But look, 
The Bible is, you'll see, realistic about the struggle that we often have with our own body image. Um, The burdens that many people carry about their own image, what they look like, can be very heavy. Uh, Although standards of beauty vary from culture to culture, we're constantly being told by our culture that we should be doing better with how we look. We need to be looking better with how we look. And particularly for women, this is an immense pressure to the point where you have impossible standards of beauty to keep. It's very hard, therefore, to feel happy about how you look. But you see how how the man responds. He immediately affirms her. Verse 9, I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Now, now, now guys... um, you should always be careful about comparing a woman to a horse. (laughs) But here in this particular situation, he probably gets away with it because in that culture, a horse was the most beautiful of animals and and Pharaoh's horses were beautifully dressed for, for ceremonial occasions. And when the lady describes herself as an ordinary rose of Sharon, when she's being self deprecating, he immediately replies by saying, as a lily among brambles, so is my love among the young women. Translation, honey, you are hot, you are smoking. Amongst all the other women, you are just the best. Now guys, pay careful note here. If you are married, your wife is your highest standard of beauty. There is no one more beautiful than your wife. Now again, this gives me the opportunity just to pause for a moment because when it comes to to love, there's a tendency for us to be like the woman in this song, to express hesitation, hesitations about ourselves, hesitations about the love of our spouse, Uh, doubts enter into our minds. Does he really love me? Does she still love me like she used to? For example, guys, if, if your wife in a quieter moment asks you, honey, why do you love me? Be very careful with what you say next. <laughs> because if you do the normal thing, the understandable thing of saying, look, I love you because you're beautiful. I love you because you're smart. I love you because of the way you make me feel about yourself, myself. Um, now, those reasons can be true. And it is worth noting as an aside that in the song, they do talk more than just about their sexual attraction towards one another. They're not that shallow. So, for instance, in verse 3, your name is oil poured out. She's speaking about his reputation, his character. But all these reasons for love, honey, why do you love me? Beauty or background or, or personality or, or the way that they, they, they make you feel. Whatever the reasons are, and as important and necessary as they all are, They cannot be the basis of staying in love because these things come and go. Beauty comes and goes. Health comes and goes. Wealth, the person's job, all these things, how they make you feel, these things come and go. They change. There's a counsellor and and pastor many years ago called Louis Smeeds who once said, my wife has been married to five different men. All of them have been me. And he's getting across this idea that you, we, we change. Throughout life, we change. And marriage is such a big thing that it's, that it's going to change you. You don't stay the same. Now, what sustains that love within the marriage can't be these changeable things. What sustains the love in the marriage has to be the promise, the covenant. Marriage is a covenant. It's a binding promise. It's, it's two people saying to one another, I'm making an appointment to be with you in 5, 10, 20, 40, 60 years' time. It's the covenant which sustains the marriage. It's the promise that brings the stability and security. Otherwise, there's always going to be hesitation and doubt. You're you're always going to feel as though you have to prove yourself to the other, that you have to earn it. You're always going to be marketing yourself to the other. But if both people are promising, if they're saying to one another, I'm going, to, I'm going to be with you no matter what. The needs of our relationship are more important than my own individual needs and desires. That's where you have the foundation for the flat, fat flower of love to grow. That's where you have flourishing regardless of the different seasons that you experience in life. Now, you might be thinking, okay, well, if that's the case, why does she express this hesitation? I mean, what's going on? 
Because actually, as you read through the rest of the song, <laughs> love is not smooth sailing. Remember in Genesis 2, after Adam and Eve were brought together, we're told the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. Now, this statement is both a recognition of the goodness that was given to them in marriage, but it's also a contrast to the tragic loss of intimacy that they're going to experience after the fall. After the fall, the man and the woman are aware of their nakedness. They cover up, they keep secrets, there is, a, there is a terrible loss of intimacy. And the Song of Songs has been described as an extended commentary on, on verse 25, a kind of poetic meditation. The overwhelming impression that this song leaves us is that love is a beautiful thing, often too, too beautiful for words to describe. It shows us love as a, a profoundly fulfilling thing in which we can find deep joy and satisfaction in a way, it is a return to the Garden of Eden, where there was that deep, intimate relationship, where they were naked and felt no shame. But the author, the author of the song, knows <laughs> that we're not in the garden anymore. Uh, we live in a fallen world, where there is hardship and pain. There is hesitation. There is doubt, there is betrayal, even in love and marriage. One commentator says of the book, the emotional fabric of the song is not wholly joyful, but sometimes interwoven with tensions and struggle. Taken as a whole, the song expresses the paradoxes of love in the world, conflict which intensifies passion, painful separation which heightens the pleasure of union. So, where are we then? in the story so far between this guy and this girl? Well, the song started with the woman who, who wanted to be kissed. Apparently, this is before she had spent any sort of substantial time with the object of her desire. But as soon as they start talking to one another, gazing into one another's eyes, st sparks begin to fly and, and, and the romance really heats up. But as far as we can tell, in this part of the book... They're not married yet. There's anticipation, but no consummation. And yet the woman wants us to stop for a moment before we go any further, and she gives us an encouragement towards patience. She speaks in chapter 2, verse 7, saying, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles and the does of the field, do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Um, this lady, it appears, is speaking to the young women of Jerusalem, maybe some bridesmaids of hers, and she's giving advice that will be repeated three times in this song. It's basically, she's saying, don't rush love. Don't, don't make it start before it's ready. It's like she's giving a warning. Sexual intimacy is one of the most powerful gifts that God has given us. But because it's a powerful gift, it can be dangerous. We need to be careful in how we use it. And so the lady wants her friends to know, don't wake it up before it's ready. Now, it can be hard for us to think of something that's actually more countercultural in our society than telling people not to act on their desires. We're always told, follow through on your desires. It's natural. Just do what you want. The great Oxford academic C.S. Lewis said that the Christian sexual ethic is so, quote, difficult and so contrary to our instincts that obviously either Christianity is wrong or our sexual instinct is wrong, one or the other. Now, the reason why God tells us not to awaken our sexual desire before it's right is, is simple. When we share sexual intimacy with the wrong person in the wrong time, we destroy relationships. Sex is designed to be this kind of super glue, this lifelong bond between a husband and wife. When we use it in the wrong way, we lose its power. Therefore, how we use these gifts that God gives us is a, is a huge test. It demands faithful patience. Now, what we've been talking about this afternoon is, is not easy. And for many of us, it's a source of actually of, of deep pain and anguish and maybe a lot of guilt. 
The Apostle Paul tells us where we can find comfort and, and, and hope and peace. When he spoke to the Ephesians, he had instructions for husbands and he said to them, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Paul compares Jesus' relationship with his people with a husband's relationship with his wife, a husband who gives up his life for his wife. The gospel tells us that, that Jesus loves you, regardless of your status, male, female, married, single, he loves you. The book of Hebrews tells us, for the joy that was set before him, Christ endured the cross, scorning its shame. What did Jesus have in all of eternity that he didn't already have before he went to the cross? He didn't have you. You are his joy. You are his heart's desire. You are on his mind all the time. When Jesus went to the cross, he died so that we could be washed clean, made, made beautiful and forgiven. And Jesus wants to satisfy your soul's deep longing for an intimate relationship with God, a relationship that we are built for, and a relationship that no other human relationship, as good and beautiful as they can be, can compare to what Jesus offers. Now, maybe you, you're feeling a little bit like Jane Eyre. You're conflicted. You have these deep desires in your heart, maybe a desire for a particular romantic relationship. But then you're confronted with God's purposes for you and His gifts. And there's a dilemma, what, what, what are you going to do? Question your desires, examine your longings. Remind yourself that as heartfelt as many of our longings and desires can be, they cannot match what we are offered in Jesus Christ. Christ went to the cross for you so that you would know God. And so, like Jane, we, we, we choose faithful endurance and patience. If you bind yourself to Jesus, you are made new. And as hard as it sometimes might be, you can find peace there. For those who are single and would enjoy having sex, you instead choose to be celibate and you find contentment there. For those who are once promiscuous, you choose to take a different way. For those who have same-sex attractions, those attractions no longer define you and control you. For those of us who are married, we choose to love our spouses over and over and over again and choose faithfulness and fidelity even after seasons of a lot of hardship. We don't pretend that God's way is easy or simple, but it is good. It does bring your flourishing. And so we give our hearts to Jesus over and over again because He has given His heart to us. Would you pray with me, please? Uh, Lord God, we do want to pause again and thank you for the good gifts that you've given us. Uh, Lord, we're, we're mindful, though, of our capacity, our tendency to either chase after the gifts that you give us more than we chase after you, or to use these gifts in a broken way, to use these gifts to even hurt others around us. And we want to ask for forgiveness. We do recognise when we think about love and, and, and sex and marriage, often our own brokenness, maybe our unfulfilled longings and desires, maybe the pain that we feel, the pain that we've caused others, the guilt that we feel. Lord, thank you that, that, that Christ became human for us. He went to the cross, bearing our guilt and shame so that we can find forgiveness, be washed clean. Thank you that now we are, we are beautiful in your sight because of his work for us. I thank you that regardless of whatever mistakes we have done, we can find wholeness and healing and peace in Jesus. But Lord, would you guide us to use these precious gifts um, 
but to delight more in the gift giver. Uh, Would you help us to find our deepest longings, our desires, our hopes, even our identity in a relationship with you? Uh, Lord, help us also to be that community where we talk about difficult things, um, where we encourage one another to, to look to the beauty of Jesus and there adore him. Uh, Lord, guide us. We need your help by your spirit, we pray. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to give you a few moments of quiet reflection and then we're going to uh, respond in song. stand and sing our response song, sing about our wonderful Jesus. You are the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high, your hidden glory in creation.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do praise you. What a beautiful name is the name of Christ, the one who has loved us, who laid down his life for us, who gave us his all, that we might live, that we might respond to you in love. Father, we pray that you would help us to give ourselves, our whole lives to you, in service of you, in praise of you, in worship of you. And Father, we do pray that in giving our whole lives to you, you'd be pleased to work in us and through us to your praise and to your glory. And Father, we pray for the offertory collected today, a small token of our praise of you. We pray that you take what we give for your praise and for the building up of your kingdom, for the saving of many souls. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, just a few brief notices as our uh, time together draws to a close as we just prayed for our offertory. Uh, if you're a regular member of the church here, you're invited to partner with us in your financial giving. Uh, if you're a guest, if you're visiting uh, then uh, please do, if you're able to uh, uh, ignore that, uh, to your, your, our guest here today, we're really glad to have you here. Uh, if you are new then, uh, uh, and you're thinking about uh, making this your home, your spiritual home, maybe you want to find out more about what it means to be a member here, uh, then do fill in one of the welcome cards. You'll find them in the seat pockets in front of you or follow the QR code on your bulletins. Uh, that gives us a way to contact you, to get in touch and to tell you more about uh, what it means to be uh, a part of the church family, how to get involved and uh, next steps. Uh, so do fill that out if that is you. Uh, after the service, we have prayer ministry. If there's something on your heart or mind, maybe something that's come up in the sermon today, uh, in the songs that we've sung, uh, you'd like to pray with someone, uh, to have someone pray for you, then do head to the back left of the uh, room uh, after the service. Trusted friends uh, with Orange Lanyards, who will keep confidences, love to pray with you and to pray uh, for you. Uh, and uh, also for regular members of the church, tomorrow a reminder is our monthly prayer meeting, uh, 7.30 in the old church upstairs. Uh, such an important time for us to gather together in prayer. So please do join us if you're at all able to. Please do make that a priority and join us tomorrow night at 7.30. Uh, after the service, uh, if you've got children in kids' zone, uh, do remember to pick them up, uh, but uh, not straight away. Um, they're practicing for songs for Christmas, uh, so uh, maybe head downstairs at 1 o'clock uh, to, to pick them up. It uh, gives you a few moments to continue fellowship, to continue chatting with others, and to enjoy uh, time together as God's uh, people. Um, that's all that needs to be said. Let me lead us in a final closing prayer, and then we'll sing uh, a final song to finish. Uh, Almighty God, we thank you so much for the gift of your holy word. And may it be a lantern to our feet, a light to our paths, and a strength to our lives. Uh, take us and use us to love and to serve in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you now and evermore. Amen.
church, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen.